Hey everybody, we're in front of the mic with the Beyond the Books podcast brought to you by accountingdepartment.com. I'm your host, Kevin Dry, and today we're joined by Bill Gerber, our co-founder of accountingdepartment.com, to shed some light on the philanthropic mission here at ADC. Bill's motivation to make ADC great and a whole lot more. Bill, how are you doing today? Good, Kevin. How are you? Great, great. Yeah, it's uh yeah, just a, a great day out here and uh just uh yeah, busy, busy, but uh that's always a good thing. So uh excited to have you on. Thanks for coming on today. Um, and we normally just start these things off with a typical tell us about yourself. So tell us a little bit about yourself and you know how you found yourself as one of the co-founders of such a great company here. Wow, you got time for a long story or no? Oh yeah, we're ready. Yeah, the <laughs> listeners are ready. <laughs> Now, uh, basically, I'm a typical entrepreneur, you know, so at the end of the day, I got suspended from school dozens of times, um, had trouble with classes and studying and reading and uh, a little ADD probably thrown in there, too. So on my uh, on my graduation from college, I decided to uh, work with a guy in a business and uh, built him a pretty successful business over the next three years. Uh, kind of gave me the uh, encouragement that I could probably do this myself. Um, I do have trouble with something called authority, so I knew I wasn't going to work for somebody else. And this gentleman gave me an opportunity to run a small business by myself right out of college, so I was really excited. Yeah. After three years of building his business up, I uh, uh, he, he decided to come in one day with a check, and he wrote me a check for my percentage of what he gave me for ownership to run the business, and he thanked me for my time. So that was my first entrepreneurial experience. Uh, my second one was, uh, that was the first one was a manufacturing business. The second one was more of a product business. And I got involved in that, uh, selling a product. This is all pre-Amazon. So there was no Amazon out there. We were doing it by the phone and we were doing it by postcards and we had all sorts of things going on. But I ran that business for about five years. And at the end of five years, uh, we shut it down. We actually went uh, bankrupt. Um, and I realized all the things that I did wrong in that business, which was a lot. So uh, after that, I decided to go off and get a job for the first time. So I got a job for the first time. It was a straight commission job selling advertising, and I did really, really well in it. Um, so when I did really well, I decided to get married. We ended up having a baby. And then my first baby, Sean, uh, has a disability uh, that about 800 kids in the world have. And that put me on a whole nother mission and path in life to take care of something that I wanted to take care of. Uh, so when I died one day, he would be fully taken care of by support. Yeah. And that takes money. So after that, what I did was I actually uh, went down to my basement after sulking a little bit. I wrote down all the things that I was terrible at. Uh, as a typical entrepreneur, I was terrible at uh, accounting. That was the biggest thing that bothered me. And I was also terrible with process. So you need process uh, to grow a business and to scale. And at the end of the day, the previous couple of companies, everything was coming to me for answers for everything. And that was no way to scale a business. The accounting word kept tripping me up, though. It was driving me crazy. I went to business school. I took accounting and I still didn't understand it. I realized that I wasn't the only one as my entrepreneurial friends didn't understand accounting either. They knew how to sell something. They knew how to make something, but they didn't know how to account for all of it. And to scale a business, you really need those three things to do. So I wanted to create a solution that would solve my problem, which was create enough money to fund a special needs trust to take care of my son. So when I'm dead, it's all set. And to do that, I wanted to also solve the entrepreneurial problem of getting involved in the accounting to make sure that everybody knew where they were every step of the way. And how did you do that? And we came up with the solution over the last 20 years that has really solved that problem for a lot of entrepreneurs, giving them real-time data, data, making sure they understand where they are on every aspect of their business, uh, from selling to expenses, to traveling, to gross profit, for margins, for divisions, for departments. And if you're looking for that type of thing, that's what I wanted to offer. It wasn't really for the small, small local businesses on Main Street. It was really the bigger companies as we grew a little bit. So that's what got me going. And uh, <laughs> at the end of the day, it, it worked out. Yeah. You know, yeah. find a yeah, problem, yeah. create a solution, and uh, and we go forward. Yeah. yeah. Now, so everybody, everybody always asks me a lot of times, how did you uh, – how did you do the work if you're not an accountant? It's the biggest question I get all the time. So yeah. 
Um, I went on a mission and I wrote down a business plan. The business plan was very simple. It was on a piece of paper or actually it was like a napkin. And I wrote down that I needed X amount of clients, X amount of employees to give me an X amount of size of business to fund this trust that I wanted to take care of. So I went around to a local CPA firm that I knew locally. They had about 10 or 15 employees. And I said, I have this business plan. Now, this is 2003 when this came out. And the business plan was very simple. I wanted to grow a company of about 250 accounts. And mm -hmm. right off the bat, the person I was talking to said, I don't have the office space for 250 people. Can't we just mm -hmm. do a company of 25? And as a goal-driven person that I am, I realized that 25 doesn't give me my goal. So that's not going to accomplish it. So I went back and I tried to figure out how to pull this off. If there's not 250 good accountants in the city that I was living in, then where would I find these people? So I went back to them and I said, we can do this all virtual. We can have people working out of their houses and they can work in the United States and they can log on to servers. And I was completely over his head. I didn't know what the heck I was talking about at the same time, but I knew that to get 250 people, I needed to go outside of the city I was in. So we, uh, I went on a path to find someone that understood what I was talking about. And I actually went to 50 different CPA firms, Kevin, before I found the person that I was looking for. I knocked mm -hmm. on doors for big firms to small firms. I pitched the idea. And as a lot of entrepreneurs know, the more you pitch an idea and the more people think you're crazy, you know you're on the right path. So DSL and cable were just coming out into the suburbs in 2002, 2003, when we started. And I knew that this was an opportunity to get good people that could deliver a great service, no matter where they were in the country, and then be able to work from home on top of that. So yeah. I started going online and I started looking for people that were looking to do outsourced accounting that were accounts. And there was a handful of them that were trying to figure it out this many years ago. Um, mm -hmm. I started pinging them online. Some of them got back to me. Other ones didn't. One kept getting back to me. I picked up the phone. I talked to my partner, who's been my partner and best friend for 20 years. And I talked to him for at least three hours the first day I talked to him. Now, the funniest thing is it was during tax season, which I didn't care about because I didn't have to do taxes, but he was doing taxes. But he still yeah. took the phone call and talked to me. Um, the following week, I actually drove down from Connecticut, where I live today, down to New Jersey, where he was living at the time. And we spent about eight hours across the table and we mapped out the same plan. We had the same ideas, you know, and we nice. wanted to make yeah. sure that, you know, if we were going to do this, that we were going to be the best. And that was the most important. Deliver a very high level of service. Make sure that our entrepreneurial friends are taking care of what they need. And then at the end of the day, it's a service business, you know. So you got to find yeah. the right people and uh, deliver a great service. And as the years went on, we partnered up. We started building slow. Um, never took any money from anybody. And we're around 200 employees now. Nice. At the end of the yeah. day, though, the technology wasn't there. Mm -hmm. So we had a lot of learning to do uh, back in the day about technology. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll tell you a short story. I remember going to somebody's house that we hired because back then we used to go to their house. We had to get on a plane, yeah. fly to someone's house. We used to open up their computer and try to stick in a do video card just so mm -hmm. they could run two monitors so they could VPN into our servers in New Jersey and work. And we didn't even know what we were doing. We didn't even know if the computer was capable of taking a dual video card. And sometimes it took us four or five hours just to try to figure out that one piece. So mm -hmm. it was kind of crazy. Now, mm -hmm. 20 years later, there's a virtual training. There's a whole training department. We have it all mapped out and everything like that. But back then, there was actually a lot of funny stories. Yeah. So that's my whole <laughs> What else do you want to know? Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. I mean, and uh, and I love that you had you know, gone into detail about really searching for that perfect business partner that has the same vision. And sometimes you just meet someone, uh, you know, like you met Dennis and it's just, it just clicks, you know? And, uh, I think that's really cool how, how you've built this up to, to what it is now. 
um and uh, you know just have a, a very specific vision for it that i think everybody here gets behind and a lot of people admire within the organization and outside of the organization so awesome awesome job um i know i'm very thankful to work here so i'm you know a huge fan um well i think but, dennis and i come from the same core values i think at the end yeah. of the day that's what it really was we also you got to remember he was he's a cpa and i'm mm -hmm. a sales and marketing person so yeah. i want this guy tomorrow and and we have to slow roll it so we've always yeah. met in the middle in 20 years we've never actually had an argument at all money has yeah. never been an issue at all either but we also slow rolled it and we made yeah. strategic decisions when we could financially afford it what we paid google 20 years ago is not what we pay google today you know when yeah. we did a trade show 20 years ago it's not like the 50 trade shows we do today so you build up a scale and as your business grows you grow with it and at the end of the day, we kept coming together for decisions to make sure we were strategically sound. But the one thing I had is I had financials. We always knew where we were. We had a budget. Right. We had a forecast. We stuck to it. We never borrowed anybody's money, asked for anybody's money, took loans from banks. We just grew it naturally, and uh, it became very successful. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so I also wanted to know, uh, so what, what was it that shaped the philanthropic mission of ADC? Well, at the end of the day, um, it doesn't matter uh, what my problem is. Uh, everybody has problems in, in, this, in this country and everybody has problems that work for us. But at the end of the day, I have a situation where I have a disabled son. It was very important for me to be home, even though I have care that helps every single day. They still need help. I need to be able to get up and move and take care of and do what I needed to do. Uh, over the last 20 years, we've been on the board of his foundation trying to raise money. Uh, we did go through, uh, when he was first born, we went through 14 different um, 14 months of three different hospitals trying to figure out what he has. Uh, my son, uh, really lucky, he has something that 800 kids in the world actually have. So it took forever to figure it out. And then when we figured it out, there was no cure. Um, but over the last 10 or 15 years, we've raised money. We've done trials. We've done tests. We found the problem. It's a genetic thing. I and mean, at the end of the day, that's what, you, that's what we're doing. You know what I mean? Try to give him a better way of life and also help, you know, other people that don't go into this situation. So yeah. that's the flow. But everybody has a situation where people here with all sorts of things to take care of their families. But we are a family first environment. Um, I don't think a lot of people believed it. Uh, after they meet me and Dennis, I think they start to believe it. But then as they start to work in the company, they start to see it. Um, yeah. At the end of the day, if I, if, I, if I have to pick up the phone right now because my kid's calling school or whatever, I'm picking up the phone. I don't even yeah. care who I'm talking to, president yeah. or whoever. I, I got things to do. So yeah. they see that. They understand that. Uh, we have people that you know have to take care of their senior parents. Uh, uh, some people have to go through hospice. We give them the time off. Some people have somebody that passed away or somebody that's going to gonna pass away somebody's pregnant someone needs longer yeah. term care whatever it is if you just deal with the family first i think that it was always client first client first client first but then you ended up and this is just from knowledge of knowing you end up with a lot of jackass clients who don't care about you as a person so we kind of tried to reverse it and make sure that the people here are really the most important especially the front level people where they're dealing with the clients every day and to make sure that the client knows that, hey, I'm a real person. I have a situation. Yeah. I have a kid. My kid's got to go to the daycare. My kid's got to go to the school. I got an appointment. I got a soccer game. I want to leave at three or four. I mean, that's life. Yeah. And mm -hmm. giving people life with flexibility is, is really what people are looking for. Yeah. You know? At least yeah. that's what we're looking for with people. Yeah, and to, to touch on that a little bit further, I know um, what I've seen over the last couple of years of being here you know, we, we go through a vetting process of finding the right people uh, to work here and everything. We also go through that same process with our clients. So, um, so you know, I love that we, you know, find those clients that, uh, you know, are, are, you know, not only, you know, good clients, but also understand that like, hey, you know, I'm, you know, I'm working with a human here and, uh, and just have that full understanding of, uh, yeah, we don't you know, they have much, families too. We don't take much bull. Yeah, I won't say the word, but yeah. we don't take much bullshit from people because at the end of the day, 
if you're making someone feel sad, all they're trying to do in accounting, all we're trying to do is do a good job for you. And if you're trying to yell or scream at us, I mean, we're done. You know, and I think in the early days, as entrepreneurs start and learn their business, they'll take on anybody that will pay them, even though it's not a good fit. And they'll deal with things that uh, you wouldn't deal with if you really had it. So, I mean, 20 years later, we're not going to deal with people that aren't a good fit for us. It's not a big deal. It's not a shot against you. It's at the end of the day, if we don't like how we're working together, it's okay. There's somebody else that will take care of you, you know? Yeah. So yeah, we vet the clients to make sure that we have good clients that care about what we do, because there's nothing worse than doing all this work and the client doesn't even care. And then, right. you know, obviously we care about the staff to make sure that they're yeah. taken care of and they have their needs. So I always say to our, our, our team, I can't accomplish my goal unless we figure out what your goal is. And that's an yeah. old saying, but at the end of the day, that's the truth. So our yeah. managers are trying to find out what do you want to do? Do you want to Do this promotion, this promotion. Do you want to go here, here, all these type of things? But finding out what someone's path is and working on a plan to get them there is 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 what our challenges are. Yeah. So yeah, awesome. Yeah, it all it all kind of comes together. So it's, um, I did also. Uh, so I wanted to learn more about this organization, uh, AHCF. Um, what does that stand for, and what's your involvement with them? Well, the, it's uh, the, my son's condition is called the Alternating Hemiplegia of Childhood Foundation, um, and it, it's just an organization that raises money to do different uh, drug trials, uh, different testing on mice and different things like that to try to figure out where this is coming from, what we can do to make a solution for it. And we have meetings every single month for the last 20 years trying to figure it out. There's fundraisers going on all the time. And at the end of the day, it's really just to help find a cure for this really, really rare condition. Uh, Mm -hmm. One of the things that we've done over the years is we actually got into the rare disease. I can't remember exactly the name of it, but um, Mm -hmm. at that point, about five years ago, that's when colleges started really coming after us because they're doing research and they want to yeah. find the solution to this type of thing because now it's it's grown and grown and grown and nobody knows what it's coming mm-hmm. from nobody knows why all these kids have all these things that are going on uh, and i'll never speculate but at the end of the day our world is this we're trying to find a solution for this and that's what the foundation really does it's also mm-hmm. a huge support uh, for these mothers and fathers who don't know yeah. what this condition is, they don't know what it looks like when the kid's five years old, 10 years old, 15 years old, 20 years old. Um, a lot of the kids do end up passing away. Some of the kids have real serious conditions. And uh, I always use it as AHC is more of a blanket name because there's different levels of severity for the kids. Yeah. And as we do more and more research, we can really hone in and define that for, for parents. Yeah. yeah. So, and parent support. Yeah. And I saw, um, I, I checked out their website a little bit before, um, you know, before this episode and they've raised 3.2 million, um, probably, probably keeps rising, uh, since 1995. Um, so definitely a good organization, um, that's, you know, doing their very best to raise awareness, try to find a cure, all of those things. And they have, they have different, uh, you know, ways of getting involved. Like, they have, you know, a research team, volunteer opportunities, uh, family support uh, team. So, you know, and that's so huge. Just, you know, letting those families know, like, hey, you're not, you're not in it alone. Like, you know, this is a rare disease, but you know, we're here for you too. Um, so, raising you know, three think... million dollars with a handful of people has been quite the challenge. Yeah, uh, there's no celebrity involved. There's no big mm-hmm. donors coming through the door, um, right. and then it's it's so rare that it's really locally. Uh, knowing the family, know, you know, like I live in a town, we might have a walk, we might have a fundraiser, we might do a whatever. Everybody's just trying to raise money to do that. And these testings and these trials are not cheap. Uh, they start at a half a million dollars or $250,000. So we're very, very cautious of where the money goes and, and yeah. see if we can find some sort of solution for these parents on where this mm-hmm. is going to be 20, 30, 40 years from now. Yeah, definitely. And um, so also ADC here at ADC, you know, we do have parents with disabled children. Um, What opportunities does ADC provide for um, for the different families that work here? Well, I think it just goes back to we're a family first environment. You know, this disabled children just happens to be my situation. 
If you yeah. ask everybody here, it's 200 people here. Everybody's got a different situation going on. Yeah. It could be just a kid that's being a pain in the ass to a parent that's got Alzheimer's to whatever their situation is. But that's the point. The point is yeah. life is life. Take care of your life. Sometimes when you come through that door to work, you just got to shut the door because you know the problems are going to still be there from spouse yeah. problems, a marital problem, all that type of stuff. But at the end of the day, you do your work and you, you yeah. know, also flip the laundry if you have to or start yeah. dinner early or go to the school event at four or three or two, whatever it is, you know. So I, I don't think it's much more as disabled children. Um, but at the end of the day, that's my situation. And again, if the phone rang or something happened and I got to go, I'm shutting it down. No matter who yeah. I'm talking to a prospect or I'm in an internal meeting or I'm talking to you on this podcast right now, yeah. I'm out, yeah. you know, so. Yeah, it's, I know. I know it's been helpful as a father of two. Um, you know, I have a three-year-old and a one-month-old, so you know it's been. Uh, you know, I love love the flexibility here. Um, you know, whenever something comes up, there's never even a question like, "Hey, please go." You know, take care of your kids or your family. So, um, so you know, that's just so comforting. Uh, being able to you know still have that professional career, but be there for the things not only you want to be there for, but the things that you need to be there for on a day-to-day -day yeah, basis. Yeah, I think it, I think it's very important not to miss anything yeah life's really yeah, fast so yeah. don't entrepreneurs yeah. seem to get buried they miss things but if you really watch how we run this and we are living it i'm, I'm going if i, you know, yeah. I have a lacrosse game at 4 30 i'm out the door you know what i mean yeah. so i'm not going to miss yeah. anything i don't want anybody else to miss anything and at the end of the day i i say to uh, our hr director all the time hire two things here hire adults with personalities you know, yeah. adults mean I know what to do if there's a problem or I know what to do if I have to leave or I know who to talk to if I have to set them up to be successful to help me with my account. And personalities are we're online. You're talking mm. to clients. You know what I mean? This is a personality business, it's a people business, you know. Yeah. So the more they understand about who we are as people and the more we understand who you are, then we, you know, our company sends gifts all the time because our clients have the same problems. You know, mm -hmm. don't think for a yeah. second they don't because they do. And that's what we teach our team. The client yeah. has a kid that's like this, a parent like this or this, like yeah. that, whatever it is. So just yeah. understand their life. I think accounting back in the day and the word outsourcing and all that type of stuff was always like, I don't know, there's somebody behind the scenes doing all this work and then they come back and they deliver. That's not what we're doing at all. You yeah. know, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a very personal relationship. Our clients buy gifts for a lot of our staff because they feel they're part of the team. It's the yeah. same people every single day doing the work. It's the mm -hmm. same CPA or controller that's closing the books and having the review. So there's a relationship that's built there. And again, I don't know how other companies do it, but this has just made sense to us 20 years ago to do it that way. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Awesome. Um, so, you know, with that, I think, uh, you know, we're going to go ahead and wrap up this episode of the Beyond the Books podcast brought to you by accountingdepartment.com. Uh, thank you so much, Bill, for joining us today and sharing insight on our uh, philanthropic mich uh, mission and what motivates you to just keep ADC being the great company that it is. Um, did you have any closing thoughts that we didn't get to touch base no, on? No, you're Aaron? doing great okay. with this whole thing. Right. Hopefully somebody <laughs> learned a little bit about me, but you're doing yeah. a great job with this podcast and I hey. appreciate us getting our word out to everybody. It's really working out great. So, Thank you. Awesome. You yeah. Are. Yeah. I'm looking forward to the next 50 years of doing it. So, um, so uh, now, just uh, because that, you had a deal with the owner here, so why don't you take the rest of the day off? Get out of here. Right. So. All right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, well, Bill, great having you on as, as always, whenever we get to talk and everything. So, you know, remember everybody listening to subscribe to our podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcast, and YouTube. Drop us a review. Uh, help us start climbing those podcast ranks because I think we're talking about a lot of great things here on Beyond the Books. Um, and uh, with that, I'm Kevin Dry, and we will ADC you later. <laughs>